So mail repro, here we go. Uh, this is uh, was supposed to be the second slide, but uh, you can probably imagine what it said on the first slide. It was just the title slide. Uh, notice that the testicle is here. The testicle produces sperm. It goes up and around and then goes mixes in with the fluid from the uh, seminal vesicle, some, and the um, prostate. Uh, prostate produces probably 50 to 60 percent of the fluid, uh, and then it dumps into the urethra and goes out through the ejaculate. Notice that the prostate gland is right there at the base of the bladder. If it enlarges, it can uh, cause pressure on that urethra. Uh, note also where it is in relation to the rectum uh, and that you can see that you can feel that prostate gland, at least the very posterior portion of it uh, in the rectum. There's a lot of the prostate gland that you can't feel uh, and you have to be very careful assuming that you've uh, done a thorough exam of the prostate. On the other hand, uh, it's an interesting question of whether there's that really any value of doing a rectal exam for screening. Uh, very controversial question. Uh, for screening for prostate cancer. So uh, the anatomy is there. You can see the corpus uh, cavernosum is not filled with blood and the penis is not erect at that point. Um, the vas deferens, obviously that is the tube that goes up. So here's some anatomy. Uh, this basically is uh, how testosterone is produced uh, testosterone is actually turned into um, estrogen and so women uh, go through the same process but have far more of their testosterone turned into estrogen. Uh, this is why aromatase inhibitors will stop that from happening. Uh, this is uh, where aromatase works um, and so if a woman has an estrogen related breast cancer you'll give her an aromatase inhibitor uh, men uh, can sometimes have um, conversion of their testosterone into the dihydroxytestosterone or dihydrotestosterone uh, stopped, uh, and that will decrease the probability of male pattern baldness and benign prostatic hyperplasia. So uh, this is 5-alpha reductase uh, occurs um, uh, there. Uh, and so you can see there's various other uh, hormones that are converted. Uh, they all do start up uh, here uh, with the pregnolone, um, but they travel down and, and all of them. Note the three rings that are involved, uh, the four rings, I'm sorry, that are involved with steroids. Uh, all of these um, hormones have these four rings, so they, they are technically steroids, uh, although as you'll note, uh, many of them uh, um, are slightly structurally different. Uh, we note that the uh, steroids that uh, increase uh, muscle mass are the so-called anabolic steroids, and those are the male-related steroids. So uh, normal levels, we can see that uh, we see that the testosterone is somewhere between 260 and 1,000. Um, the SI units are international. We won't uh, discuss those today. Free should be between 50 and 210. Uh, we're going to go over uh, fairly extensively testosterone deficiency, um, but you can see that all of the, the levels have a normal level. FSH, if it is particularly elevated, uh, would suggest uh, menopause or um, that the hormones uh, no longer are being produced and the body is trying to pr uh, produce more stimulating hormone. Okay, so let's talk about late onset hypogonadism. So this is basically uh, men that have decreased testosterone or testosterone deficiency syndrome. We know that they often get low libido, but low libido comes from a lot of different things. Erectile dysfunction, same thing. Decreased muscle mass and strength, well, as men get older, they often decondition. They can become anemic. Uh, they get increased body fat, especially visceral. Again, lots of other things do that. Uh, osteoporosis, and uh, if a man has osteoporosis, he should have a testosterone level done. Uh, decreased vitality, um, energy, does that go down with age, impaired cognition, and depressed mood. So. As you can see, all of these are pretty non-specific findings. 
So if you have one or more of those symptoms and then you do a uh, testosterone level and you have a low serum testosterone level, uh, then we know that uh, um, some people will believe that they have um, late onset hypogonadism. Uh, you should do uh, testosterone levels in all men with osteopenia or osteoporosis. And uh, there's arguments as to whether um, men should be treated. Um, you know, uh, this study said only about 5% of men with low T were being treated. I think there's lots of different possibilities for reasons for that. So risk factors uh, for having low testosterone, diabetes, COPD, arthritis, renal disease, HIV, obesity. And again, the challenge is, is that a fair number of them uh, will have low total testosterone, but normal free or vice versa. Uh, and that's why I think it's really useful to check both total testosterone and free testosterone, especially in men that are obese or men that are on narcotics routinely. Metabolic syndrome, hemochromatosis, lots of things can do. So what do you do? Well, normally we get a morning specimen. doesn't have to be fasting, but because of the normal diurnal variation of testosterone, we really want it between uh, 7 a.m. and 11 a.m. Uh, we start with the serum total. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because a minute ago we talked about the low being 260, um, but we really don't have any total agreement. Uh, this study, uh, the, the Wong study, uh, really looked at uh, 10 or 12 different labs and noted they all uh, established a different low. Some uh, go up as high as 350 for the low, some go down as low as 230. Um, most people use 300 as the low. Um, we don't find that men in that 2 to 300 level usually get a whole lot of benefit from uh, testosterone supplementation. Men under 200 usually do get fairly substantial benefit. So again, the, the Lazaro study looked at 25 different labs, said there were 17 different uh, ranges for normal, uh, and uh, um, the low was anywhere from 130 to 450, uh, and that was even with the same test kits. Uh, most used two standard deviation, um, but uh, by definition, only 2.5% uh, will be abnormal, and if the prevalence of the condition is greater than 2.5%, it'll underestimate it. Um, and, and again, age-adjusted values make it uh, more uh, challenging. A lot of older men will have low testosterone but don't seem to get a whole lot of benefit from supplement. Uh, we really don't know what we're doing, to be honest with you, with testosterone testing. And again, the free, uh, if the total is between 230 and 350, you probably want to check a free. Uh, and either way, you need to do a confirming test. Uh, and as we say, with obese men, it's particularly important. And the um, free testosterone test, um, uh, sometimes you want to do an SHBG. Almost never now we're doing those because the testing is uh, more sophisticated. If you think there's a pituitary issue, if you don't think it's just a testicular failure, uh, and if the testosterone is very low, lower than 150, you probably should do a luteinizing hormone and a prolactin just to see if, in fact, there is a problem with the pituitary gland. These are not commonly done, um, but uh, it is something that is an option. Uh, the usual trial of therapy for testosterone is three to six months. Uh, you try to see if the libido gets better. Uh, you try to see uh, if bone density changes, although that'll often take longer than that. Um, in men's with um, uh, borderline testosterone, uh, at, at three months, you definitely want to reassess. Uh, usually, we'll redo the level. Most people shoot for about 600 uh, for the level, which is sort of halfway in between. If 300 is the low and 900 is the high, 600 would be right, 100, right in the middle. If you get a man that's at 600, uh, he's not really noticing any difference in his quality of life you're probably not going to necessarily continue the medication as it is uh, a controlled medicine uh, and it is uh, uh, you know, hard to give because it either has to be given in a goo that's transdermally uh, or injectable. There is no oral form of testosterone that is approved in the United States. Uh, there are other countries that use it, but uh, it's felt to have too many side effects in the oral form. Uh, the PDE5 drugs or the erectile dysfunction drugs, um, you may find that if someone's using something like a Viagra or Cialis that uh, 
with testosterone. They need less of that medicine, um, but um, it may or may not validate the appropriateness of continuing the medication. Um, and again, they may have better muscle mass. Uh, they may have better cardiovascular function. Uh, the problem, of course, is, is that we now uh, feel that there is no association with heart attacks, uh, but there are people that uh, argue that since testosterone is often associated with cardiovascular disease, that uh, uh, it is associated, but um, right now the general feeling it is, is it isn't. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, I had a man that went on it, had a heart attack, uh, and uh, the cardiologist told him, well, we don't think it is, but you never know. And the next thing you know, they're questioning you. <clears throat> um, there are uh, other salivary tests that might be used. A lot of the naturopaths are doing a lot of salivary testing, uh, maybe more stable than levels in blood. Uh, right now, we don't think it's standardized enough uh, for routine use, but somewhere down the road, it might be. <clears throat> other endocrine testing, um, you know, thyroid, et cetera, we really only do if we think there's indications for it. You've got to do a PSA and a rectal exam prior to doing testosterone treatment, uh, just because if they did have a prostatic cancer, it could really accelerate it. Uh, you definitely want to do a CBC because the treatment can cause um, polycythemia, which is too high hematocrit, and basically give them kind of thick blood. Um, you would never treat anybody that you think might have male breast cancer. So if they do have any sort of lumps, um, you're probably going to need to get a mammogram slash ultrasound and uh, rule out a cancer. So at three to six months, you repeat the PSA, make sure that that has not gone up. Uh, do that at least uh, um, a couple of times in the first year and then annually after. You do a CBC at the same intervals just to make sure that they haven't uh, gotten that uh, high hematocrit. <clears throat> but um, after, after that, uh, once a year, testing is probably adequate. Uh, if someone has a high LUTs, uh, lower urinary tract symptom score, uh, then that's a relative contraindication. You probably want to get that straightened away before you would give them testosterone. If somebody already has a high crit, you don't give them. If somebody has untreated sleep apnea, uh, which is, you know, you'd think that that would be uncommon, but there's a lot of people that refuse to wear CPAP, uh, and so they do still have um, sleep apnea, and you're really not supposed to give those people uh, testosterone. Uh, and anybody with um, untreated or poorly treated uh, heart failure, obviously, you're going to be very cautious. Um, so clinically, you want to make their symptoms better. Um, you know, uh, look at each one of them. Uh, some people use for labs, you know, try to get that into the lower to mid young adult range. So, you know, four or five, six hundred, uh, try not to go much above that and, uh, and see how they do. Uh, I have had a lot of patients that I've started on testosterone over the past 10 years. Uh, I don't have a lot that have maintained on it just because they think it's going to cause all sorts of wonderful things to happen uh, for them. Uh, and uh, uh, it rarely does. It doesn't make them uh, thin, healthy specimens if their lifestyle uh, is otherwise not conducive to that. So BPH. So the first thing is, remember, it's hyperplasia, not hypertrophy. Hyperplasia is an increase in the number of cells. Hypertrophy is an increase in the size of the cells. Uh, and the pathology in this particular condition is hyperplasia. Um, you'll hear it called hypertrophy because years ago that's what we called it, but that is not technically correct. 75% uh, of men over 50 do have at least some enlargement, uh, may have some um, difficulty starting their stream, maybe feeling of incomplete emptiness, um, but uh, not all of them seek out treatment for that. Uh, some will eventually need surgery, but the majority we can actually manage pretty well with medications. Alpha blockers relax that uh, sphincter, that urinary sphincter, and allow people to empty their bladder more completely so they don't have to urinate quite so often, and, and often they will not have to get up at night if you start them on an alpha blocker. And the 5-alpha reductase, as we were talking about, stops the conversion of one type of testosterone to another type and usually will stop the um, enlargement of the prostate. Uh, it takes months uh, before a 5-alpha reductase uh, medication uh, will work. Alpha blockers usually work within a week or so. 
So the prostate goes around the urethra. You know, think of it as going right through that donut hole, uh, and so it will increase outflow resistance. So therefore, they get a decreased force of their stream. They'll get maybe a little bit of post-void dribbling. Uh, they'll get up at night to urinate. Uh, they'll have urgency. Oh, my God, I got to go. Um, and then sometimes they'll have a little bit of uh, blood or dysuria. Obviously, that requires a differential diagnosis to make sure they don't have infection or uh, cancers or other causes of those. Um, um, hematospermia, where you have blood in the sperm, does occasionally happen to men. If you have one episode, you can probably just ignore it. But if it's recurrent, uh, they should be referred to urology. And so when you have BPH, before you can start them again, you got to do a digital uh, rectal exam. You got to do a PSA. You might do an ultrasound, although that's usually reserved uh, for um, the um, um, urologists. Uh, the USPSTF guidelines do not recommend any of these things for screening. Uh, but if you have BPH, uh, you definitely have to do them before you would start them on a medication. Pharmacologic treatment, the alpha blockers, again, relax that sphincter. Uh, we see that the uh, hormone blockers, the finasteride, uh, is an example of that. Avodart is another example of that. Uh, and they will basically, um, you know, block the hormone. Erectile dysfunction is the inability to get and maintain an erection adequate for intercourse. A lot of men can get the erection, but they can't maintain it through intercourse. 25% uh, of men 65 and older. Uh, we used to think that it was all psychological. We now know that it's physiological, that uh, um, there is that PDE5 um, that, uh, um, you know, will interfere with the uh, filling of the uh, corpus cavernosum. And if we give the uh, PDE5 uh, medications, uh, that blood flow will be restored and those men will get um, adequate erections. So again, uh, uh, here's the, um, um, the metabolism, the PDE5 uh, will actually change the metabolism, that cyclic GMP, and the cyclic GMP relaxes the um, uh, blood vessels so that the uh, penis will fill with um, blood uh, and that the man will get an erection. Uh, Viagra is a common medicine used, uh, also known as sildenafil. Before sildenafil was Viagra, it was actually a medication called uh, Rivadio. Rivadio was used for pulmonary hypertension at 20 milligrams three times a day. Uh, that went generic about a year ago. Viagra is technically not generic. Viagra comes in 25s, 50s, and 100s. So if you need to prescribe sildenafil generically, you have to use the 20 milligram tablets as of right now. Uh, or else uh, um, they will pay a brand name cost, which is anywhere from uh, 10 to 50 times greater than the generic. Uh, Levitra is, is just another medicine that works the same but works longer, and Cialis actually gives you the longest effect. So some other miscellaneous uh, effects, the varicocele, peyronies, balanopostitis, and torsion. So a varicocele is basically just a varicose vein. It should only occur on the left side. If it occurs on the right side, it usually means an intra-abdominal mass. Sometimes you'll get it on both sides, and in that case, you're less worried. But if it's just on the right side, you have to be concerned that there's an intra-abdominal mass. Uh, that uh, varicose vein sticks out just like any other varicose vein. Uh, feels like a bag of worms, usually diagnosed in the teenage years, does seem to abate as men get into their 40s, 50s, and 60s. You don't feel them quite so often. Uh, occurs in one of six men, very common. Uh, if it's severe, uh, can be related to uh, infertility, um, but it's a pretty unusual cause of infertility, as you can probably imagine. If one of six men gets them, uh, it's ob obviously not that common that it results in infertility. But uh, if you have a severe one, uh, it could change the, the temperature in the scrotum. Uh, normally, the temperature in the scrotum is a little lower than the body temperature. Uh, and if it's higher, um, then it will interfere with fertility. This is why men that are in hot tubs or men that wear exceptionally tight underwear or whatever uh, might have problems with infertility. 
Uh, Peyronie's disease is a plaque that occurs on the outside of the penis. These men will uh, complain of some curvature of their penis. Uh, generally, it's something that if it isn't interfering with their sexual activity uh, and it's not bothering them, you don't have to do anything. Uh, but that plaque can be removed, but obviously it's a, it's a fairly extensive surgery. Balanopostitis, um, the biggest reason I put this on is because we're seeing it a lot more because of the so-called SGLT2 medicines. Those medicines cause a lot of uh, sugar to be released in the urine. Uh, and so balanitis is inflammation of the head of the penis. Balanopostitis is inflammation of the head of the penis and the foreskin. So obviously in uncircumcised men, you get balanopostitis. Circumcised men, you can get balanitis, but it's nowhere near as uh, frequent as postitis just because usually it's fungal. Fungus likes warm, moist, and dark, and uh, obviously it doesn't get more moist, warm, and dark than under that foreskin, although, you know, vaginal and feet also are warm, moist, and dark. And torsion is something that happens. There is a little retinaculum down here that holds the penis in position. If uh, the penis twists around, it'll twist the blood flow. If it twists enough, it'll actually cut it off. Uh, if the uh, um, penis twists and twists back, the pain will go away. If it doesn't, uh, then you can actually have um, death of the penis. I'm sorry, death of the testicle. So that little retinaculum, they usually put a couple of stitches in there. Uh, if that happens, and it'll never happen again. So, all right, that's men's health. I'll do GI next.